Hi, Jim here, just dropping in before this week's episode to tell you about my latest movie, The Apocalypse Box. It's a horror film and I'd love for you to check it out. If you go to apocalypsebox.co.uk, you can find all the links on where you can watch the movie. Right, let's get on with this week's episode. Hi, Jim here, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker podcast, career advice from people in the business. This week, I'm speaking to filmmaker Tom Malloy. Tom has a huge string of credits, starting as an actor, he then went on to produce films, he's written and sold screenplays, he's raised finance for movies, and he's also directed. I asked Tom about his route into the industry, and we also went through the whole process of production with all of his tips on writing, casting, financing, uh, production, sales and distribution, and film festivals for anyone wanting to work on their debut feature. Enjoy. uh, Talk me through your route into filmmaking. Well, I was always had had it in my mind to be an actor from the time I was really young. And I did a film in 1998, I believe, called Graves End. And uh, we shot it. It was my first, you know, like acting experience other than the stage. And, you know, I've been performing on stage as a little kid. Um, but I was 19 and we shot on the streets of Brooklyn. And we would just go up to a street corner. There'd be a gang of thugs and we'd be like, you guys want to shoot a fight scene? And they'd be like, yeah, you know, and a big, big fights would break out. And, but when it was done, we got Oliver Stone to put his name on the movie. And so it was in theaters. Wow. That being said, when that came out, I thought, oh, wow, I'm never going to have to be anything but an actor. And when that didn't happen a couple of years later, I just decided I didn't want to be a waiter or bartender. I wanted to learn everything else about filmmaking. So I just decided to be an actor, writer, producer when no one was doing that. I remember I had an agent at the time that said, you know, well, you have to focus on one of those things. And I guarantee that same agent now would say, you have to do everything. You can't just be one of those things. And uh, so I kind of trailblazed that. And so that's the beginning part, but then that was, that was the foray into it. And now I've just produced my 27th movie. I've uh, options sold, made movies, 25 of about 30 so scripts. And, um, you know, I own Glasshouse Distribution, distribution company, and, and so yeah, rolling along. And I've been in you know maybe forty movies as an actor. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I can attest to that because I do my usual bit of digging on IMDb, yeah. and it's a very full page. <laughs> yeah, your page, there's a lot of lot of credits, a <laughs> lot of films, a lot of productions, yes. um, and obviously you've got your YouTube channel, podcast, course, all on filmmaking. Yeah. So I thought what I would do is we would go through making a film. We're going to make a film mm-hmm. together. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you for some tips sure. along the way. Yes, all right? yes, of course. So, okay. So the the first and most obvious one for me is I'm writing a script. What are some of the mistakes people make at that at that point in the process? I'd say the one of the first mistakes that they make is that they don't take time to read scripts beforehand, especially reading scripts in the same genre as whatever they're trying to make. Um, I'll still do that. I've been in the writer's guild for mm-hmm. 20 plus years. I will still do that. If you, if you commission me to write, like for example, there was just recently, these guys asked me to potentially write a script about a hockey team in the U S and the true story behind it. Before I write that, if it's, if it comes to fruition, I'll read one or two films. If I can find something about hockey, but it's something about like building a sports franchise script and so that I go, okay, that's how it's laid out, especially a successful one, a one that you really like. But so yeah. that's really, it's not like you're copying it or anything, but you're just giving an, getting an idea of how that flowed and that's successful. So why not try to model it somewhat in the same structure and the same tone? Yeah, agreed. Uh, reading scripts is good. And also it's, it can be really good experience reading a script as well. It's kind of like reading a book really quickly. You can quite enjoy, especially if it's like an Oscar winning uh, script, it's, you know, it's, there's it's great. And you know, it's a funny, the, so many people that oh, I, you know, I wrote a script and uh, I go, Hey, how much do you read scripts? They said, well, I don't read scripts. And it's like, that's the equivalent of like, you know, I just, this morning I was at the dentist. That's the equivalent of like watching them and going, I could, you know what I mean? Like you're not, you know, so people watch a movie and they get an idea for a cool movie in their head and then they just decide that they're going to do it. And it's like, you really should learn the, the, the rules first about screenwriting and go into it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking, I'm thinking about this script, even at that stage, genre, I'm making a low budget film, by the way, I'm making a micro yeah, low budget yeah. film. Does genre matter? What well, should I be aiming at a genre? Hundred percent. You know, the one thing that I would say is like I tell people they make an action movie. I know it's tough, micro budget, but uh, horror, thriller, sci-fi, uh, 
or if you're gonna if you really want to do a drama or you really want to do a comedy make them vanilla like i just produced a comedy and there was like no curse words no sex no nothing in it because those are sellable worldwide the second the joke is everybody wants to make the edgy drama and the edgy comedy like every first filmmaker wants to make that edgy drama with the cursing and the sex and the drugs and all that stuff and those are the least likely to sell and make sales so i just say just try to stay away from those okay fine make a drama but make it a more family friendly and it doesn't have to be all you know wine and roses or whatever but it has to be at least you know to just pull back on the cursing pull back on the drug and the sex use you know what i mean so that that's what i would say and is that um probably putting your distribution and sales yes. hat on is that because the buyers don't want that or the streaming platforms they don't want swearing they don't want nudity, well, i'd or... say that it's more for i mean say there's some of the streaming platforms yes but then also it's more for international sales. You know, it's like there, mm. it, it, the second you have an edgy drama, it's just, you're killing your sales in the Middle East. You're killing your sales in Africa. You're killing your sales in China. If you know, it's, it's harder and harder to sell to China these days, but you know, those were things that you just like, they have a censor board and you can't get past those. So why not set yourself up for more success and still try to tell your story without putting all that edginess in it. It's, it's just, it doesn't, it, they don't play even, you know, even us, they just, they're very tougher. They're much tougher to sell. Mm. Interesting. And, um, then going on to, so I've got my script, I've chosen my genre, the worst, my least favorite part of the whole process, raising finance. <laughs> give me, what's the magic bullet for that? Well, gee, I don't know what, if I can give you one magic bullet, you know, I wrote, <laughs> the book on film financing called bankroll. And that was the bestseller of, you know, 2008 and 2012. Now it's everything's on filmmaking stuff, which is, we put it all online and I'm sure that's like, yeah, that's right. You found me through filmmaking stuff, filmmaking stuff mm -hmm. at HQ, which is the membership site. And you know, what I tell people is that, it, you know, film investment is very fun for high net worth individuals, H and I's if you get them involved, you get them excited, but at the same time, you have to make it make sense. You have to structure a project in a way where it just makes sense that it's potentially going to make money, you know, and, it, and that's not you as a filmmaker going, well, I just, I'm going to do this for a million. Why? Why a million? Well, because that's you know, the budget I thought of and I'm going to cast unknowns, but really good actors. And uh, I'm going to make my edgy drama and it's going to win the Oscar. And if you do that, great. Congratulations. You've proven me wrong, but most likely you're going to lose somebody a lot of money and then you're going to be looking for other investors. So try to make a viable project that makes sense. And if you can make a project where it makes sense on paper, investors start to pop up. It just becomes irresistible. Hmm. And is there a, is there a sweet price point do you think of, or budget level for micro and low budget? Well, a lot of it depends on the scope of the movie, meaning, you know, how many characters, locations, everything. But I would say these days, it's like there you, you have to almost look at it. I look at it like three cogs, right? Like you have this big gear and I have like, like I have a studio project that's slowly, it's a slow gear that's, you know, that's 30 million and up. Then you have those medium ones. And I did two of those last year where I ended up bringing some money to, I was one of the EPs uh, and then, you know, maybe anywhere from the two to $5 million range. And those, you really need a studio behind it even today. Now, I don't mean a huge studio, but like a Tubi or a, um, you know, uh, a Hulu or an Amazon, you know, somebody like that that's gonna jump on. The micro budgets, God, the joke is it just keeps getting less and less. If this was five years ago, I would have said under 300,000. If this was 10 years ago, I would say under a million. Now I'm gonna say, be smart under, 50, 60,000, you know, I did a course on filmmaking stuff called Backyard Blockbuster. And that's what I was talking about. It was that, you know, you can pull a, you could pull a great movie together for that price if you know what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I've got my money, I've raised my finance, thank God. Um, now I'm onto casting. Yeah any tips for that and only you do you think i should be going after names you know what what give me some advice well, a lot of times with the micro budgets it's tough to do like the union but if you're out in uk maybe you could get around that you know the get around the screen actors guild but it, it, so th there are some people that work non-union they work fi core and they'll do you know non-union as well as union stuff so so much of it is relationships. Like this last movie I did was a small film, uh, the, the the vanilla type comedy. And so I reached out to a couple of my union friends. I said, this is non-union, just FYI. And they, the two that I know, they were, you know, 
well-known actors, they didn't want to do it. Um, but some don't mind. They may be five core. They may just not care. It's okay. You know, it's, and it's, it, it, people need to understand the union can't do anything to your film. They can, they can theoretically go after the actors, but they don't, they've never, I've never heard one person ever getting in trouble, but you know, they, they go after if they were doing it for big money. But anyway, long story short is that you, it, getting celebrities and names. Yes, you should. I mean, how do I do it? You, if, when it's super low relationships, just friends and, um, I'm in that kind of scene and I'm out in Los Angeles. So those are the things, but if you do more markets and film festivals, you start to formulate these relationships, but it all goes down to them believing in the script and you as a director slash filmmaker, that's what they have to believe in. And then actors want to work in good projects. doesn't matter the money, especially if they're celebrities, they don't care as much about the money. They care about good projects. Yeah, very true. Um, so in this imaginary project, I'll skip to production. And I know I can't ask you for a million tips for production. So that's a big yeah. chunk. But what is there? Is there anything you wish you'd known before you started making films about the production process? Well, specifically to the production process, I would say, <laughs> this is funny, don't get too excited when you're shooting. I think that everybody does. And I've seen it now with when I produce a movie and somebody, it's their first movie, you know, some investor or some, or, you know, some filmmaker. And it's like, I, I just remember reading years ago in Michael Caine's great book, Acting in Film, that everybody like buys the yachts and Ferraris when they're shooting and then they sell it all when they see the assembly edit. And it's true. I mean, my friend Ison Robbins, a producer said, he's never not cried in an assembly edit. <laughs> but I know that's a joke, but the key is once you see it, it's like you go, there's a lot of work to do, you know what I mean? And it's it's almost like you're trying to make this statue of David and you see the assembly and it's a big rock that might have starts of the shape of a head and starts of a shape. And then you go, okay, we gotta edit this. And that, that's when you realize filmmaking is an editor's medium. And that you have to understand that, that that's really what counts is how they put that together. You can take the best dailies ever and make a horrible movie and you can take mediocre dailies and make something that's awesome. Yeah, very true. I've been in that situation myself where you've come home, you've cut it together and you've gone, oh, no, what is this? <laughs> and then you spend the whole yeah, year. Like, oh, I wish I shot it. that or I wish I did that. Yeah, it's tough and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in the editing suite, that's grim. Um, so then say I've uh, cut my film together, please, with it. Film festivals for micro budget. Is it worth doing film festivals? It's a good question. Is it? It, it depends on how you're defining worth. Like if it's worth, is it worth it for you as a filmmaker to meet people and get connections and get awards and things? Yes. Is it worth it for sales of the movie? Probably not unless you're in the top five to 10 film festivals, you know, that's just a very small list and very tough to get into. So I would say do it for different reasons. If the, if you're believing in that old, tale of like go to Sundance get the bidding war and it's like yeah that happens one out of you know 300,000 movies and it, it, so it's to me it's do that but at the same time focus on the distribution getting you're going to film markets and meeting the sales and distribution people and getting a sales agent on board getting a distributor on board and thinking about it from a marketing perspective like how are you going to get that film out there and, and making money so yeah. And so you brought up film markets. Um, obviously, AFM's coming up, um, which is one I've not been to oh, before. Wow. Tell me, tell me about AFM. What would I expect? Is it worth a filmmaker yes. going, first of all? And what should they expect? And what should they yes. be doing? Well, I haven't um, been there either, except for 20 years in a row. <laughs> so no. Oh, right. Yeah, oh, I literally, <laughs> um, no, I went the first time in 2005. And I'm like, I'll never not go to this. I was just like, I enamored. And now, funny enough, I'll be in can uh friday i leave friday and i'll be there till the 24th or 25th and um that's for mipcom which is another market and more tv oriented market but uh yeah afm for a filmmaker you know walking in it's just like you feel like it's the new york stock exchange of the movie business and it's it's really where you see you like you you think oh i have this idea for a chainsaw horror movie. And then you walk in to where it used to be in the lows and you see posters for 20 other chainsaw horror movies and you go, oh, okay. You know, like it's, and so I think it's very important in my estimation for a filmmaker to experience that or can, 
maybe not Berlin as much. Berlin's a little bit more targeted, but I would say the Moschee to film in Cannes in May or the American film market, just to go there and go, okay, this is how the business side of it works. So then you can kind of start to back in and understand the process because as a filmmaker, as a director or a producer or something like that, many of them don't understand that. They just, oh, we'll put a million dollars in the movie, we'll make, we'll make an edgy drama. It's like, yeah, and then we'll just, you know, we'll take it to Sundance, we'll win Sundance, we'll get 20 million done. And it's like, that's not a plan and it's, it's not gonna happen. So if you understand the market aspect of it, you can probably be way more prepared. Yeah, definitely. So I, I would say I'm similar to you, but mine is can because obviously it's yeah. a lot closer. So that's where I would used to go every yeah. single year. Absolutely love it. And I think also it's such an energy boost as well when you come out of there and you've you're surrounded by creative, surrounded by people who are also making movies. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I used to say like can um, and I think I've been 12 times there and, uh, but I, I used to say, I'd come back with a stack of business cards. Now there's no, not as many business cards because a lot of people are doing digital stuff, but it's, uh, but either way you, you just get, yeah, you've got that feeling of these are people that are doing stuff and I want to be part of it. So no, I love the Moschino film. I mean, it's, it, it'd be tough for me to miss that. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Which, um, out of the two, which do you think is better for a micro budget filmmaker, can or AFM? Dep if, if for an American micro budget filmmaker, or I, I'd even extend that to a UK. So I'd say an English speaking movie, I'd say an American film market is better. You know, cause if you, if you have a right, foreign, okay. if you're a French movie, if you're a Spanish movie, no, I definitely can, definitely can. But anything mm -hmm. with English speaking mm -hmm. movie, um, I would say AFM is just better. That's what, because they, the buyers know that's, what's going to be there. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, so sales and distribution, again, that's a dangerous part of yeah. the process because you can really mess up there. Any, what are your tips for that? Well, do your research on each company. You know, it's like, if you go to Sinando, C I N A N D O, that's the database of the, uh, film sales agents and distributors. So look and see what movies they've done. And then I, I always said, that I just put this in an email to somebody like never ask for references. And in fact, in general, that's a dumb practice because no one's going to give you bad references. So if you ask me for references, I want to give you people that are going to speak highly of me. So it's better to just look and see the movies, find out who the producers is and reach out to those people. I'm guaranteed they'll be happy to say if they had a good experience or a bad experience with that company. And so if you do that, you get some kind of perspective on it. Um, so that's, the, that's your best way to check them out. I, I don't believe the kind of filmmaker belief, for lack of a better word, that, that there are sales agents and distributors out to screw them. I think that probably, yeah, there's five or so that might be unscrupulous. But in most cases, people, filmmakers don't realize sometimes that there's nothing they can do with the movie. You, you made a movie about some Shakespeare and you updated it and you put all kinds of curses and stuff and you're mad when the, the statement says you only made $5,000 and it's like, you know, all oh, the distributor screwed me. It's like, nope, <laughs> they didn't do anything. They tried their best. Um, you know, I had, I remember we've had, we have 193 movies now. And I think about all the movies that we also had, we had one edgy drama that I really liked, but it was kind of a street drug type movie. And those filmmakers just thought their movie was going to make millions of dollars. And we were excited about it, but everybody passed on that movie. Everybody passed. But they got, you know, they kind of flipped out on us afterwards. Like, you know, he screwed us, you know, that type of thing. And they were the film that we said, after this, we're going to show every filmmaker all the meetings we took where they requested your movie. Because it's like, mm -hmm. I could show you 30 companies and we got zero sales. That ain't on us, dude. These are 30 companies that mm -hmm. we pitched the hell out of your movie. Like it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. They all watched the screener, blah, blah, blah. So since that, those idiots, we obviously let their film go. But from now on, we take every movie, we show all the meetings that we did where they requested it. So you know that if if you get zero sales, it's like, no, we did our job. It's like the buyers just, for some reason, didn't fit their schedule. The movie didn't flow. They just didn't, you know, wasn't right. Their budgets were, the, that's why they didn't pick it up. So, Yeah. Well, that's interesting to know. And I wish maybe more sales and distribution were that open with that information. Because I, I guess as a filmmaker, sometimes it is frustrating. Obviously, you you hand your film over and you just cross your fingers and hope they're they're out there pushing yeah. it for you. So you don't sometimes get that real time feedback oh, as yeah. to 
Well, that's why, you know, I started the company with a guy named Brian Glass, and that's why it's called Glass House, but it became the double entendre of full transparency. We go, here it is. You can see everything going on inside and just watch us doing it. And so, yeah, we try to do stuff that's a little bit different so people can feel like at least they're, because I, I found that many times, or at least most times, as long as you're communicating with the filmmakers, then they're okay if it's not a success, you know, they get it. They're like, so it's unfortunate, but then they get it. But, you know, it's, it's when you're hiding that information or you're unreachable, that's where the filmmakers start to freak out. Yeah, definitely. And going into AFM, is there any particular type of film or genre that you think is going to sell well? Well, always action. I, I just, It's just hilarious that every buyer we go, so, you know, say it's a new buyer, we don't know them. We go, what genres are you looking for? The first word out of their mouth, oh, action, you know, it's like, it's so funny that they say that. Again, that's the hardest to shoot micro budget, but if you can find a way to do it, um, you, you probably have some potential money on your hand because we, we even had a couple action movies that were not good and they still made a lot of money, so, yeah. Oh, really? Right. So, so are you, when you're talking, how much action have I got to put in it to call it an action? Has it got to have martial arts has it got guns well one or the other or both you know it's yes is the is the answer because i'm I'm thinking of another movie that tr tried to approach us as an action movie that was really a drama with a little bit of gunplay you know what i mean it's like well come on that's yeah. not an action movie but i'd say that um but the joke is that movie still did sell okay because we were we the trailer was oh. heavily action oriented <laughs> but um i would say yeah it has to have you know 20 30 percent uh shooting and martial arts in it to make it action so. i hope you enjoyed that episode if you'd like to hear from more industry professionals how they got into the business and how you can do the same or you just want to listen to some cool stories from movie sets around the world then please do subscribe to the honest filmmaker podcast mm -hmm.